Hi there, and welcome to the Biz Communication Show. I'm your host, Bill Lampton, the Biz Communication Guy, bringing you tips and strategies that will boost your business. And I do that through a conversation with a business communication expert. And through our, our conversation, you will hear winning words and ways that you can apply to your business. Today, coming to us from St. Louis, Missouri, Lois Kramer. Lois is an industry expert working with speakers, consultants, and experts who want to book more business, make more money, and monetize their message. She started her company, Book More Business, after working in sales and marketing at United States Steel Corporation and managing a successful speaker's business. Lois Creamer is a regular presenter at events for the National Speakers Association, Canadian Association of Professional Speakers, and other professional speaking associations. United Kingdom, Ireland named her an honorary fellow in the year 2020. How impressive is that? Lois is the author of the best-selling book, Book More Business, Make Money Speaking. And she's the co-author of the speaker author, sell more books and book more speeches. Lois Kramer has appeared in Forbes, Bloomberg Business, Speaker Magazine, and the Wall Street Journal. So join me in the privilege and the pleasure of welcoming Lois Kramer. Hello, Lois. Bill, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been looking forward to this, friend. I have as well. You and I have known each other professionally for a number of years, and I have benefited, as so many have, from the insights that you have into the speaking industry, and that's what we will talk about today. Now, in the introduction, I mentioned that you had a first career with U.S. Steel's Corporation. So my question would be, quite logically, <laughs> what was it that prompted you to leave U.S. Steel Corporation and become a highly respected and even revered consultant in the professional speaking arena? Well, Bill, I left U.S. Steel for the best reason of all, to raise my daughter, to stay home and raise my daughter. For ah, years. yes. And uh, that was the most important thing to me at that time. And when my daughter got to be about 10, I got a call from a professional speaker. A college friend of mine told him to call me. And uh, he was looking for somebody to manage his speaking practice. And I said, well, I'm not really looking for a job. I might be willing to work while my daughter's in school. And we actually had lunch. He was ahead of his time, Shep Hyken, uh, and he hired me and I worked while my daughter was in school. He gave me the flexibility I needed. And that's how I got in the speaking industry. So kind of by accident, Bill, quite frankly. Well, life fortunately has bad accidents, but there's some good accidents as well. Yeah. Let's say that, um, and I imagine you've had this happen to you. Let's say that I'm a business leader, that I am gaining momentum in my profession. And as a result of that, I'm invited to speak at conferences and conventions, and I enjoy it. I enjoy telling what I know about my specialty. Okay, at these conferences and conventions, I notice too that there's nearly always a keynote speaker who's brought in. And that looks like something I think I could do. Um, so I'm, I've, I've heard about this Lois Creamer being one who helps people get into the industry or if they're already in it to propel their professional progress. So Lois, I've come to you and I've, I've outlined that to you. What are some of the steps that you would tell me to take if I truly want to become a full-time professional speaker. Yeah, you know, it to me, Bill, it all begins with the speech and the ability to deliver it in a compelling way. And those are the two things I don't do. Uh, I don't tell people what their expertise should be. I don't give people presentation skills training and I don't help people write speeches. But when you have a speech 
And there are people who can do all these things uh, and you want to make money with it. I'm the one that you come to, to help you market it and sell it. Uh, but it all begins with the speech. So I would tell anybody who's interested in speaking, develop a speech, make sure that you're getting reaching out for help if you need it and make sure you're practicing it. Um, and Bill, I always recommend Toastmasters as a great stop for people who want to get into speaking. I call it the off-Broadway of speaking. A lot of our colleagues, Bill, still go to Toastmasters to practice material, to get great feedback on what they're doing. So those are the things that you need to do. You need to have a great speech and the ability to deliver it in a compelling way. I think uh, I think you've made an excellent point there because we get good at things by practicing them. Yes. Now, I will say that um, a favorite saying I've had for a long time, some people say practice makes perfect. I say, no, pra practice makes permanent. <laughs> so <laughs> along the way, that's why someone who's a, a speech coach comes in handy for, yes. for people who want to improve. And in addition to Toastmasters, I would say they're many other opportunities that an aspiring speaker uh, could take advantage of. For example, if you're in a town where there are civic clubs and who isn't, they've got 50 programs a year that they need to fill. And that is, that is a wonderful place to hone your skill and to learn how to get the audience involved, to handle questions and answers to sharpen your content and to sharpen your delivery as well. I, I totally agree. And, and I have to say, Bill, I used to speak on sales to corporate sales teams and associations. And when I developed my speech, the first place I took it were to chambers of commerce in my area uh, who gave me 20 to 30 minutes to present to the Elks Club, the Lions Club. I called it doing the animal circuit, Bill. <laughs> to all of the, but what I was looking for was the economic capital of a testimonial. A testimonial that stated she had good information on selling that was highly applicable to us. That was the most important thing. Then I needed to leverage the, those testimonials into paid engagements, and that's what I was able to do. Yes, the testimonials are key because uh, we can tell ourselves that we're skilled, but there's there's nothing to match uh, testimonials from somebody who has seen us in action. Now, following your guidelines, as, as I have over the years, there are many misconceptions that beginning speakers or even veteran speakers have that you help us correct. And one of them which we need to address is that so many uh, aspiring speakers are, as I say, even some who've been at it a while, if you ask them what they speak about, they'll say, oh, my gosh, you, I can speak about just anything. You give me a topic, I'll be there, give me any kind of audience and I'll fit. But you talk about, you talk about having a, a narrow target audience. Uh, explain what that means and what are the advantages of that? Why, why is that a benefit? Well, generalists who are professional speakers aren't working. That's why I don't suggest it. What the market wants are people who have highly developed expertise in a specific area that they apply to a targeted market within an industry. So people are looking for experts. Those are the people who are getting the opportunities today. So I say be highly targeted. Don't offer too many programs. Um, I tell my clients three or four programs should be the max that you offer. And, and I always tell the story, Bill, about the Cheesecake Factory. I say, I love the Cheesecake Factory. Uh, one thing I don't like about it is when they hand you a menu, it has 180 options on it. And I'm never willing to put myself through reading 180 options. So I always order the same thing because I'm there for the cheesecake. But don't be the cheesecake factory. The reality is decision makers who are looking for speakers to fill slots are looking to make the best decision they can. And when we give them too many options, too many choices, they will go to someone who offers fewer choices 
because that person is seen as a true expert. So taking that expertise and then applying it in a market is absolutely essential to give you some direction where you want to go if you truly want speaking to be a business. Um, too often, I'm told by people, uh, I have a great leadership program. It would be a fit anywhere who wants to develop great leaders. And my reply bill is always, well, let's go call everybody and see if they're interested. And since that isn't a market, I say pick out a market and see where you resonate in some of these opportunities you and I were mentioning when you're just starting out. I, the first client who hired me for a sales program was a bank. And it really resonated well, so well that they asked me to go to their other banks. And so my sales programs, um, I niched in the financial services industry. I worked with banks, credit unions, mortgage houses, insurance companies. And the interesting thing is every time I took my message there, the next bank, credit union, mortgage house, and insurance company was more interested in me because they looked at me as an expert in sales who also has expertise in their industry. That is the sweet spot. And you money isn't the barometer of success necessarily always, but it is a factor when you're trying to make a living doing this. So those are the reasons why I say have highly developed expertise that you apply in a targeted way. You and I were on a webinar together recently and we were talking about this topic I made a comparison that you liked. I said, Lois, that let's think, for example, of the medical profession. If I have a broken leg, am I going to go to a dentist or, <laughs> or, or an audiologist? No, I, that's, they, they wouldn't want me there. And that wouldn't do me any good if I went there. They would refer me to the specialist. And, and the medical profession tells us the the value of being a specialist. And then you've reflected that very well. Lois, in, in a couple of seconds, we're going to, going to come back and we're going to talk about what you call a positioning statement, why we need that and what that means. So we'll be back shortly. Do you wish you felt confident about giving speeches? Do you want to deal with difficult people constructively? And what about becoming more persuasive in sales? Then keep listening now to Dr. Bill Lampton. He spent 20 years in management, so he knows the communication skills you need for success. I urge you to call the Biz Communication Guy today for a no-cost but very valuable 30-minute discussion about your communication challenges. Call now, 678-316-4300. Again, that's 678-316-4300. We're here with Lois Kramer on the Biz Communication Show. And Lois is an expert uh, in book more business, and we're we're talking about how speakers can do that. Okay, we've we've established that being a generalist doesn't work. So we need to to pick out a specific area, as you illustrated well, you did at the start of your presentation career. Now, you've said many times that we need to have a positioning statement. Is that the same, uh, Lois, as what we've called an elevator speech? Or what is it? And, and how do you advise people on how to develop one that really attracts buyers? The, the whole reason, quite frankly, Bill, that I started my business was based on my sense that most professional speakers really sucked when it came to describing what they did. Most would say, if you say what you do, they would say, I speak on sales, I speak on leadership, I speak on communications. And to me, that's a missed opportunity. People who buy our services want to buy the outcomes we bring. That's really what they're buying. What's the difference we're going to make to them? And so my sense was that a positioning statement that's, that uh, describes us by concept and outcome of working with us is the best way to introduce ourselves uh, in business, in quite frankly, any kind of business, but especially in the intellectual property business, which a speaker is in. And uh, you heard my positioning statement when Bill introduced me. I could say I'm a consultant in the speaking industry, 
But instead, I say I work with speakers, consultants, and experts who want to book more business, make more money, and monetize their message. And so a great positioning statement has a concept and outcome of working with you. It differs from an elevator uh, speech, Bill. Elevator speeches typically are defined, are defined as 30 to 60 seconds. 30 seconds is a long time if you have no interest in what I'm talking about. A positioning statement is seven seconds or less, and it allows the person who is listening to us, it allows them to either ask us a question, how do you do that? Tell me more about that. Um, or it allows them to say, this really isn't a fit for me. The same online, really, if you go to my website, bookmorebusiness.com, on the homepage is my positioning statement. If it resonates with you, you'll dive in and want to know more. If it doesn't, you'll move on. And that is the beauty in a positioning statement. I think it really helps us to clarify who we are to people. It allows a buyer to say, I'm interested or I'm not, which is half the battle, I think, being a good steward of our time when uh, looking to sell what, what we do. So my positioning statement is still the first thing I always work on with clients, Bill. I like very much your advocating brevity on it because uh, the one, as you say, if, if one is a, a canned, memorized 45 seconds, uh, then somebody's going to be looking over your shoulder to see the next person that they That's want right. to talk with. Uh, and and also, it must be, and, and I'm sure you you teach this, it must sound conversational. It, it can't sound like an, an actor reciting a line exactly. in a play. It, it must be what I would tell you if we were just sitting across each other at a, at a, a coffee shop and you say, Bill, what do you do? And I, I tell you, and it's brief and it's, it's not all that glossy and, and you get the point very quickly. Now, there's another point that you help speakers with and and we all need help with this and that's fee setting uh being able to st uh, state a fee that represents the value that you bring and also being able to negotiate and that's an important part of dealing with speakers bureaus or with uh, uh co corporations who have representatives that select speakers themselves so give us a couple of tips about how to negotiate our fee. Well, you said it well. The first thing we have to do is have a fee. Uh, whether And negotiation is just a part of the game. You're in a negotiation. Any If I say my fee is a million dollars, if you don't say yes immediately, we're in a negotiation. But the key is establishing a fee. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges for people coming into this industry, starting up in this industry, and even working in this industry who are looking to raise their fee. Where, where should I be? And the reality is it's easier now than it used to be because we can access online what other professionals are getting, typically, for their speeches, who they're speaking to, what they're getting, what their background is, what their experience is. And you kind of want to use that as a barometer of where you need to be in the so market. So it's not just a guessing game anymore. It isn't a guessing game. And Bill, before the internet, it was. It was just asking around, really. It was asking others uh, what, uh, what they're charging or just asking a decision maker, what's your budget for this meeting, which is still a good qualifying question. But I want my clients to go in with a fee. Uh, and then if they don't have that amount of money, then it's a negotiation. And my clients uh, do, have a line in the sand bill about what is the least amount of cash they would be willing to take. What's the least amount of, of money they'd be willing to take. So, for example, if my fee is $10,000 and a decision maker says our meeting is $8,000, that's our entire budget. We don't have 10. Then I'm in a negotiation. And it may allow me to say, if eight is okay with me, these words, if I could do that, meaning accept the 8,000, 
what else of value would you be able to offer me to make this commensurate with my regular fee, the fee that my other clients pay me? And what, what might that be? That might be, especially now, great video. Are they videotaping? Can I get the master footage of the video? Yes. Can I get a written uh, and uh, video testimonial? Will they bring me back uh, next year within 12 months at my full fee? Will Those are all important. Me? Yes. Absolutely. Do I have a product, a book that they'll buy for all the attendees? All of these things, my clients want to have a list in front of them before they get into a negotiation so they know what, what is valued at them. And if you do this, uh, you're a great negotiator, you're prepared. And if you don't, then you're kind of left in the lurch to accept probably a lesser amount than what your fee states. And what may happen, Lois, is that instead of coming out with the 10,000 value that you ask for, uh, our, our compensation, with these other extras, you're really getting more <laughs> because this, listen, if, this if, has happened if, to if me. To give you a good video, what would it have cost right. you to produce that? If you're exactly, if they're going to invite you back next year, and my gosh, you and I've already said what are what are great testimonials about your your professionalism? What are those worth? Uh, I have I have to mention here that when I started out. Uh, 25 years ago as a, uh, a fledgling speaker, there was one speaker's bureau that said they would represent me. And I gave them my materials and a fee. After two years, nothing had happened. So I politely called them and said, have you gotten any inquiries? They said, really, no. And I said, well, why? And they said, your fee's too low. You look like a beginner. You look like somebody who's hungry and you'll take anything. So we have to set fees that, that yeah. reflect our expertise, don't we? We do. And this is a great example, Bill, because I think that a lot of people misunderstand uh, where speaker bureaus are in the industry. Speaker bureaus make money by taking a percentage of your fee. Typically, an average would be 25% yes. of your gross fee. That's how they make their money. So it only makes sense that they're not going to work with beginning speakers with very low fees. They're not, it's not worth their time. There's no percentage of value there. That's exactly right. And plus uh, bureaus typically, um, uh, they typically find us, we don't find them. This is always the big conundrum among speakers. How can I get listed with a bureau? Uh, bureaus list lots of people. The important thing is how can I get booked by a bureau? And to me, the best way, you, you can knock on their door all, all you want. Most don't answer unsolicited uh, requests. I think the best way to get into a bureau these days is to, if you have a colleague who works with that bureau, have them introduce you in. Mm. Then the likelihood of you're having a conversation with them. Referrals are great in all of our yeah. business. Yeah. E exactly right. Bill, you hit it on the head. To me, it's all relationship driven. Oh, and yes. bureaus want to talk with people they know are going to be good. And if I'm referring you into a bureau I work with, I know that you're good or I wouldn't I wouldn't offer to make the interview. Sure. Well, you, you remind me of what we many of us at um, NSA meetings would say. Uh, bureaus find you when you, you really don't need them anymore. <laughs> well, you know, they are looking at some of the big conferences and who's on the platform, who got rave reviews. And it only makes sense when, when you consider how they make their money and how they market themselves. But I, I always tell my clients, never count on a bureau or an agent to book you. You have to be the one who's doing work on your behalf. I say, look at it like mana from heaven if a bureau comes and gives you a booking. Uh, you, we need to depend upon ourselves. Nobody will work harder for us and our business than we do. Lois, what a fascinating and informative conversation this has been. I knew it would be because I'm, I'm speaking to the speaker's expert, widely recognized, widely admired, and certainly we listen to your advice. I know that there are those who will want to get in touch with you, so please give us your contact information. Uh, Bill, people can, I think the best way to reach out to me is uh, either send me an email, Lois, at bookmorebusiness.com. Just go to my website. You can get all my contact information on bookmorebusiness.com and uh, feel free to reach out 
Uh, I write a blog. You can sign up for a blog there. Get a free ebook if you do. For those interested in speaking, uh, I would be happy to have you do that. Thank you for that. And now that you've given your contact information, I'm very happy to give mine. Starting out with my YouTube channel, my YouTube channel has over, I believe it's over 450 instructional videos now. Uh, at the start, most of them were solo presentations, but in recent years, I've started hosting the Biz Communication Show, and there are many uh, interviews, really I like to call them conversations, with experts in business communication, experts at the level of Lois Kramer and many others who will bring you those winning words and ways and help you with your business. And, and while you're on my YouTube channel, go to that that item that says subscribe, subscribe, and you'll have access not only to the 450 plus videos that are there now, but to those in the future as well. And, and it's our favorite word, you know, free. That's, that's everybody's favorite word. And then of course, my website, as the biz communication guy, quite logically, my website is biz, B-I-Z, bizcommunicationguy.com. When you're on the website, you will find a spot there where you can subscribe to my podcast, The Biz Communication Show. So please do subscribe to the podcast and you will continue to hear experts every week. Then, like any other professional, I want to talk with you. So give me a phone call, 678-316-4300. And I'd like to hear about your communication challenges and problems and how I can assist you with them. Lois, getting back to the way that, that you have helped us all and giving us a greater insight into and understanding of the speaking profession. In 30 seconds or so, how could you pull together our conversation? Well, Bill, I would just say this, that speaking is truly a business. And if you are serious about speaking, you need to do the things that will set you up to be successful. And that's first, have a great speech. Uh, second, I always say, Bill, if you wanna be a speaker, speak. Look for any and every opportunity to be in front of an audience. Uh, I used to say, Bill, when I started out, I was tempted to stop at bus stops that had at least three people <laughs> and started speaking. <laughs> Mercifully for them, I did. But get that experience speaking. The pay you're looking for in the beginning are those testimonials, the social capital, the social proof that you need that you can do what you do. And then be proactive in thinking about a target. What path can I go down? What kind of target can I look for for myself? Realizing that anyone who approaches us in any industry where we're a fit, we can work with. But as for the finite amount of time that I have as a solopreneur to market and sell myself, I'm going to choose a path. I'm going to pick an industry and markets within an industry. And then just keep working hard. We only gain as much interest as we put out there. So be writing, put out a blog. You don't need a book to be a speaker. You can write a blog, 500 to 800 words on one thought, one aspect of your expertise. This is how people tap in to the depth of your expertise and how they get to know you. Gain video whenever you can. Do interviews like I'm doing with Bill uh, so that you're active on social media so people can see you and connect with you if you're interested. But this is hard work. Speaking is hard work. We only get paid when we're on a platform and we work like heck for every platform opportunity we get. So that would be what I'd say, Bill. It, it's, I love this industry, obviously, but I never downplay that it's, uh, that it's an easy one to be in. That's a terrific way to pull together what we've talked about today. And one thing I would add, Lois, where you say it, it takes constant work. It takes great marketing skills. It takes content creation. But to me, there's everything you do to get before an audience that wants to learn something, wants to improve their skills, 
and you have a part in that, that is a great privilege. That is a great thrill. And it makes everything that you've done up to that point so well worth it. Absolutely. Totally agree with you, Bill. Thanks again to Lois Kramer for being with us today. And I know you will want to contact her. And I thank my associate producer, Mike Stewart, the audio guy. Uh, Mike and I have been working together since 1996. He's my tech and, and uh, marketing guy. And I want to thank those of you who have joined us on the video portion and on the podcast I'm Bill Lampton, the Biz Communication Guy, and the Biz Communication Show will be with you again next week. So I invite you to join us.